I'm the kind of guy where you give me a new video game and I'll play it for an hour. I'll realize where I screwed up. I'll stop. I'll play it for another mm. hour, realize where I screwed up, stop. And then my third playthrough is when I'm serious. On it. And that's kind of how I wrote. Mm. I wrote two books that were god awful. Mm. And then I wrote a book that was all right. And then I started writing seriously after that. So like by the time mm -hmm. you actually started seeing anything that was getting anywhere near Amazon or Royal Road, you were looking at my third book. This is the Crit RPG Podcast. Your one-stop shop for everything Lit RPG, Progression Fantasy, and Royal Road. Hi, everyone. And welcome to the Crit RPG Podcast. And if I, you see me being green today, it's not because I'm envious. No, it's because I'm here with Kale Plemon, author of Tower of Somnus. And as we've discussed before the podcast and the bonus material, lots of other books too. Really nice. How are you doing, Kale? Pretty good. Good to be here. <laughs> yeah. We've been having, I think, like 45 minutes of fun before the podcast. This was great um, before, like, the main the YouTube show. Um, and this is, like, the obvious plug. Go to my Patreon. Go check it out if you want to. Um, I won't bother you with more of those. Maybe at the end. I can't promise. <laughs> but, yeah. Subscribe to his Patreon. <laughs> yes. I need to, like, add, like, a hypnosis loop in this, like, Subscribe to my Patreon. Subscribe to my it's Patreon. Like a, a third panel with like Hypnotoad from uh, <laughs> yeah. Futurama. Yeah. Or um or like the the thing from like Family Guy. It's like uh this is the greatest TV show you have ever seen, except for maybe The Wire, right? <laughs> uh, Breaking Bad and yeah, it's fun. Um so I think without further ado, we should like to completely let's like jump into it. Tell us about your books. Come, uh, pitch them to us and tell us why you wrote them. Um, well, uh, the sort of pithy response as to why I wrote them um, is the one that I have in my author bio, which is that um, I am a longtime dungeon master, but as everyone's getting older and having kids and going on vacations, it's hard to wrangle everyone together. Um, and so you, my dear readers, are a captive audience that when I tell a story, you're there and you listen to all of it and you don't complain about critical hits. So thank you for that. <laughs> Well, no one complains about critical hits in Lit RPG. Yeah. Because it's, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> you're in the right but, place if you um, like, like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, yeah, book-wise, I, I really took a weird and meandering route to Lit RPG. Um, I think earlier we were talking about like genre fiction and how, um, you know, norms in romance and norms in literary RPG. I actually sort of came here via paranormal romance, which is kind of weird. Um, it is a very different world. I've, I've read a lot of romance just because like mm. I read a lot of, I, I read a whole bunch of fiction, which is I'm sure not abnormal mm. for anyone, you know, listening to this. Um, so I, I read a whole lot of romance, a whole lot of like traditional golden and silver age, um, sci-fi and fantasy. Um, and then I kind of moved on from the paranormal romance to um, Wuxia, Zhangjia. I am sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, but um, the sort of, you know, like the stuff that was on like Wuxia world for a while. And then I started getting into the like real dark place where I was listening to like reading the like machine translated stuff that like <laughs> would have like 500 readers total. And like, you know, you oh, get no. to like, yeah, no, no, it was just like borderline incomprehensible because it was like the old really bad machine translators. And then while <laughs> I was doing all that, I found Royal road. And then I found Amazon and I found Lit RPG on Amazon. And I'm like, wow, this is, you know, like the machine translated stuff I'm reading, but it's a lot better. And so then I, I started reading Lit RPG and I'm like, no, this, this is just kind of the better version of what I was reading. And then I got really into it. Um, and then I also, um, what was the, the other one I always credit as my inspiration is, you know, I, I kind of had the imposter syndrome thing going where like, I, mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I think I have a book in me, but I don't know. It's really hard to write a book. I had been doing NaNoWriMo. I have a couple really bad books. None of you will ever see because trust me, they're really bad. That, that isn't imposter mm -hmm. syndrome. I've reread them. They're really freaking bad, man. Um, but so like, I'm like, you know, can I write a book? Can't I? 
And then I got drunk and I watched The Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> oh, okay. And I, I just had this thing where I'm watching this movie where the plot is borderline incoherent. It's just special effects, plot holes, non sequiturs, just coming at you a mile a minute. And I, I, you know, this is well after it had come out in the movie theater, and I pull out my phone and I look it up, and this movie bait made a billion dollars. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, if 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 Rise of Skywalker can make a billion dollars, I can write a book. And I, because I could write something better than Rise of Skywalker. Yeah. Like I, I, you know, I might not be at the biggest audience, but I can find an audience. Like I, I, I can clear that threshold. And so that was that was my inspiration. <laughs> I have so many friends who need to hear this <laughs> because they are like, well, I don't know if I can read this book. Is maybe isn't isn't all that good? I'm I'm looking at you, Sam. I'm looking at you. Like just read the fucking book, man. <laughs> like, well, like, yeah. The worst well, is going to happen it, it, is like you get a mean comment. Oh no. Well you, well, you could write War and Peace and get a mean comment. You're still, you're always going to get mean comments. But um, no, you don't understand, Kale. If my book is perfect, no one's going to be mean to me. I'm going to be universally accepted and loved. Yeah. Yes. Sure. No, you. I. I have. I have books that don't get mean comments because I shut comments down. Yes. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> That's book. the only way Easy to do it. Like, like yeah. the, the, the one trick all authors, uh, all uh, all authors hate. Like, just disable comments. Like, Problem solved. No, um, like, well, the other one is like, this is a joke that my dad used to tell me when we would go like canoeing and hiking, mm -hmm. um, which is if you see a bear, you don't have to outrun the bear. You have to outrun yeah. the guy standing next to you. Yeah. And that's kind of my thing on writing is like, to this day, I'll reread my books. and I'll be like, oh, wow, there's a whole bunch of stuff that didn't hit exactly how I wanted it to. Mm -hmm. The scene didn't gel the way I wanted it to. But at the end of the day, um, if you as an author ever apply the same sort of lens that you apply to your work to a major published work. Like mm -hmm. if you just go back and reread, you know, someone really good, like Brandon Sanderson, you'll mm -hmm. find, you know, things like the same words starting two sentences in a row, the sorts of things that like cause me to have conniptions when I'm writing. And at the end of the day, if you draw someone in, they're not going to notice it. They're, they're having a good time. They're liking the book. And what you need to do is you need to learn that, you know, there are things you should be doing to try and improve your craft. But at the end of the day, you know, just write it. And if people don't like it, they don't like it. But they'll probably, you know, you'll probably at least have some people like it. And like, if you're, if you're looking at like some very, very, very successful novels on Royal Road, they're not ma like, master like Mastercraft novels. Like I'm, I'm not putting anyone else here. Like Rhaegar, for example, like he read his entire first book and it's like tremendously, tremendously better, right? He, I mean, he wrote pretty much all of um, Azarenth Healer, um, and I think it's like it's, it's, it's a really good book now, right? But it's, yeah. it's you writing for like making the perfect piece of art that you love is great. But you either do that and then you never publish it and you shut up about it because it's for you and you only. Or you accept that there's always going to be people who don't like what you're writing and you put it out there and you appreciate the people who do like it, right? It's either or. Everything in between is just a recipe for misery. Yeah, no, and, and like one of the other things, part of the reason why my advice to baby writers is always, you know, it's always said, but just write is um, Azrenth Healer is a great example of this. It's what I sometimes I call juice, where you have this sort of like X factor that's like how the characters gel together, how the plot hits its beats, how yeah. the tempo of the plot works. Um, if you read Azrenth Healer, the way that the power levels move on there's always this sense of expl exploration and yeah. wonder and he even has a tagline for it you know there's always another drake yeah. um like that is such a great motif because at the end of the day i don't know if he thought this out but at the end of the day it is a story about exploration and discovery that is the core yeah. of azarenth healer and yeah. he found a great motif for it that he could have as sort of um a coda that he would come back to and it is 
a book where even though before the rewrite, some of the prose was rough, it had impeccable juice. It just had it, it, it like yeah. the tempo, the gel, everything was so amazing that it was real easy to skip past the prose. And then he fixed the prose. Mm. So go yeah. read it. It's really good. And I think like what you were just saying, like the, the motif, the the core concept of the story is something I've learned to appreciate more and more and more as I write, because it helps you so much in every single aspect. If you know what your story is really about, then you know what not to write. You know why the thing that you're writing is boring. You know why your readers are dropping off is because they don't, they might not even know what the fridge your motif is. But everyone can feel it. It's like a, like it's like a smell, like a sense, right? So um, I got this whole idea about the concept from um, from a book that Phil Tucker recommended. Uh, it's called "Take Off Your Pants," and it's by Libby Libby something Libby. Um, ah, you will you will find it if you Google it. It's a really really good book. It's about um, plotting in a way that doesn't scare our, us poor poor pantsers. Um, it's really good. And she has like, this idea of like the core motif. And her example is Charlotte's Web, where Will Will the Pig, um, you know, has to learn about like life and death and that death is unavoidable and that life is still good, even though there's death in it, right? Because at the end, like, you know, uh, he always tries to like escape death. He always tries to like be immortal. And then at the end, like Charlotte, the sp his spider friend dies and he's like super heartbroken about it because like that's the lesson he needs to learn. Um, and if you're looking at any lit RPG that's like doing really, really super well, there's always a core motif. Primal Hunter is super, e is like a super easy motif, right? Because it's like, I want to go stronger because I want to defend my friends, right? There's not much to learn there, right? But it's just like, oh, God damn it. I'm going on a tirade. The idea is with flat characters is not, they discover some sort of truth, but they have a truth and they teach it to the world. And the way Prima Hunter teaches it to the world is with violence, which is good, right? Like Mon uh, it's a genre, uh, yeah, yeah. One Piece too, right? One yep. uh, One Piece. The motif is like, um, I want to have a really cool band of friends, like my uh, like my hero Shanks, and I want to go around the world and explore the world and uh, uh, liberate people to ha have their own freedom. That's that's the thing, right? And that's like yep. the whole like freedom versus like government thing. Um, and you can find that motif to end the, end, the, end the sentence. You can find that motif in everything, right? Every yeah. single island is about basically freedom to do what you want and being nice versus rules and oppression and and rules and or oppression um, in either the criminal or governmental way. Thank you for coming yeah. to my TED Talk. No, and I mean, like, that's the thing. It's like, I uh, sometimes we call them uh, elevator summaries or executive summaries. Every mm -hmm. series, if you're writing it, needs to have an executive mm -hmm. summary. So, for example, Dream of Wings and Flame, one of my series mm -hmm. is um, a monster evolution series about a kobold mm -hmm. that is absolutely convinced that he's a dragon and it's just a matter of time before he finishes evolving into one. Which and so, yeah. yeah. And so, the, 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 like the theme thematically, what it is, is it's blind optimism can change the world. That's your like, Aww, like your, your, that's cool. Your well, that's the thing. It's like, so he's um, his entire thing is that he is so convinced that this is going to mm. work mm. that he just sort of makes things happen. He takes risks that are mm. absolutely idiotic, but he's convinced that things are going to work out because mm. it's his destiny. That's compelling. And mm. things mm. things happen that way. Um, and you know, there, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on, but like, that's the thing is like, you need to be able to describe your entire series in one to two sentences because like, mm. um, I think it was a, I think it's a Ronald Reagan quote, but it works for everything, which is if you're explaining, you're losing mm. where if, if your reader can't sort of glean the feel for what you're doing mm. through your work. And it isn't something simple that they can easily pick up on. Hmm. You're making a mistake. So hmm. like, you know, Tower of Somnus is corporate dystopia mixed with an alien invasion and try in survival, you know, hmm. when you're sort of like being like ripped apart between these two forces. So that's your hmm. like sort of like core 
everything comes back to those thematic elements. So like Mm -hmm. every book is going to have some element of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was talking about how one of my earlier books, Blessed Time, is a time loop. And the reason why I got some pushback on that is because Mm -hmm. I broke my core motif. My original core motif was there's time loops and no matter what you're doing, you're making things worse through the time loops. And it's him suffering through the results of his actions as the time loops keep, keep getting worse and worse. Um, yeah. Which and, then is the second half, mm-hmm. and then the second half and the final two books is more of a standard fantasy situation where there's, you know, a big evil guy and you need to, you know, collect the artifacts you need and prepare to defeat the big evil guy but it doesn't mm-hmm. use the time loops anymore. And those are both like, both of those are just fine. They're just fine motifs. They're just fine, yeah. you know, ideas for how to write and how to structure things. But by yeah. sort of like breaking it like that, there were a significant number of people who were just like, mm-hmm. Hey, what's going on? This book doesn't feel the same. And it's because mm-hmm. I changed it. It's because thematically motif wise, mm-hmm. um, it functionally is a different series, even if it has the same characters in the same, you know, world mm-hmm. and the same, you know, magic system. Like I think Brandon Sanderson, one of his lectures, I uh, remember that vividly. One said, "Like, don't pull a complete one hundred and eighty on your on your readers, right? Yeah. Like, don't make it a romance story that's actually about a serial killer, and you only notice this in the middle of the book, because people who want to read serial killer stories won't, won't get hooked by it, and people who are, who do get hooked because they like romance get disappointed, and it's kind of like yeah. the same, yeah." Yeah, interesting. Okay. Um, I mean, while we're at hooks uh, or motifs, what's what's some other motifs you want to... Um, you, you have like two more, right? Uh, yes and no. So one of them is more um, what I would call me executive producing a book. I mm-hmm. did developmental editing on it. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a ghostwriter guy, so I'm not taking any money from this other guy's book, but my name is on it because in part for marketing purposes, in part because mm-hmm. I worked pretty closely with him during the writing but I don't want to take any credit from Alex. That's, that's his baby. That's his book. He wrote it. Um, and then um, the other series is Viceroy's Pride. Uh, and the motif from that one's actually pretty meta. It's just kind of like a, it's a love letter to the genre. Like it's mm-hmm. just, I, I smashed a lot of things together that I thought were cool and tried to do it in a fun way. Okay. Um, so it's, the main character, um, basically there's a botched alien invasion and we get magic from the botched alien invasion, but the aliens are coming back. And so mm-hmm. we're trying to figure out how to fight back against the aliens. And so it's the main character is sent to another world to try and get the magical stuff they need to start awakening um, you know, wizards on Earth so we can fight back. And then there's um, a war with the aliens and then there's you know, another alien race. There's a lot of like, you know, space elves, space orcs, people in like magically powered power armor and magic mechs blowing up space orcs in like New York City and stuff like that. Cool. Um, but, 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 but there's like a whole bunch of callbacks where um, one of the running jokes is that it's a lit RPG, but it's, it's, it, it kind of is tongue in cheek about how lit RPG is illogical sometimes. Mm. And so one of the main characters, like the, the system in it, is based off of it's basically aim bots there's like nanobots that are in people and the idea is that magic is incredibly complex and hard to cast and the nanobots just sort of remember all of these like you Mm. know mini muscular movements or whatever that you're doing in order to cast it and they do it for you and so skill levels are like the nanobots in your arms helping guide your sword for example that's nice but so the the main character is like why are we dividing this into levels? Like, why why are you making this seem like a role-playing game? And it turns out that the person who is funding this entire thing is an eccentric billionaire that had, like, you know, ran a whole bunch of MMORPGs. And he's like, well, it looks like a, it looks like an RPG because I think RPGs are cool and I'm the guy <laughs> with $10 billion. And that's their answer. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, yeah. And then, uh... then, like, that guy shows up and he's like, well, I'm sending you to another planet. So you have to start a harem. And that's another one where, you know, don't confuse your readers. I confuse my readers because I was never going to write a harem, but I just oh, thought no. the dodgy old billionaire, like taking the like 28 year old guy aside oh, no. and putting an arm over his shoulder and be like, 
need to bang all the elf girls is like exactly <laughs> what it would like be like the sort of like, this is kind of what, you know, what happens in the genre, even if I'm not going to yeah. do it. And so then I got like a whole bunch of people who are like, I dropped the book because it's a harem. And then the other half of the people are like, I was promised banging elf girls. Like, <laughs> Shout outs to Brian Norton. Um, yeah, like people always go like, uh, it's a bit of an in-joke if you haven't been on the podcast before. Um, um, Brian Norton did an amazing podcast. Uh, you can go listen to it. And he um, he has um, his main character, Sal, um, has carnal intercourse with a female in the first, I think, 15 chapters of book one. And people are like, is this harem? And is this harem? And he's like, he's Irish. We're both European. And for us, like, no, this is a regular standard college experience. What are you talking about? Right? Yeah. Um, and like I, I, I guess American sensibilities are a bit different. And um, Brian said in this wonderful, I think it's like a bass. I don't know what he was. He says like, I really pity you if you never had something like this happen to you in college. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, <laughs> Brian's great. <laughs> he's 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 amazing in the in the immortal worlds of Seth, Seth McDuffie, um, who was chatting with him and I was there. Um, he said, I looked at this guy for two seconds and I was like, this guy fucks. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I mean, so my right. thing is I always do fade to blacks, but like, I don't know, like yeah. one thing it's I like a... to do is like, I, I don't like to be too sort of quippy, but there, there need to mm. be certain like, you know, callbacks. Like, so the one that I really liked actually in uh, Blessed Time, the time regression mm -hmm. that I threw in there is the main character regresses to being like 12 or whatever. And when mm -hmm. he's about 14, he meets his love interest from the previous loop. Ooh. And, <laughs> and like he, like at some point he reveals that he, you know, he's looped like two or three times and he's interested in her. And mm -hmm. I just have one of these moments where it's like, I don't care that you're, you know, a thousand year old vampire. I'm not going to prison for this. I'm not sleeping with you. Sort of like, <laughs> yeah, oh God, you know, our yeah. like nod to anime moment. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, but it was like the very... main character was a thousand year old vampire yeah, rather yeah, yeah. than the like sort of like creepy love interest. Oh god, yeah. Like this is this is actually like a very, very good reversal. I like it a lot. It was fun. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um tell me a little bit more about like how you wrote Tower of Somnus, or um I'm also interested in um, um Dreams of Wings and Fire. Dreams of Fire Wings? Sure. Um so Tower of Somnus was I was just kind of, I, I joke that I write a lot of series about things that I don't like. Mm. And Tower of Somnus was, I had, I don't even know what VR, VR MMORPG, like full dive, whatever I had mm. read. I'm like, man, this fucking sucks. I, I, I don't know if I you have to bleep me out or not, but like this, this, this sucks, right? European um, podcast. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so I'm like, this sucks. I, 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 I think we need, I think we deserve better than this. So I'm just sitting there and I'm like, I really, really don't like a lot of the VR MMORPGs out there. There are plenty that I like, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of ones that were just rubbing me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I want to write a VR MMORPG that works. And the primary problem I had is there was a lack of stakes. Yeah. That, um, you can solve that by, yeah, you can solve that by sort of setting it on a farm. Yeah, and I mean, like, some people <laughs> tried to achieve stakes by, like... Um, Sorry, stupid pun. Yeah, by, like, uh, you know, oh, I'm raising money by selling in-game items to buy my sister yeah. medicine. Like, the, you know, um, Moonlight Sculptor, literally the origins of Royal Road. Yeah. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, like, that just didn't do it for me. And so that's mm. how I kind of came to um, Carve Somnus. And part of... Part of what it is, is Tower of Somnus is a little tongue-in-cheek with some of the more esoteric political theories out there, where mm -hmm. um, obviously it's cyberpunk, so it's like a, a hyper-capitalist dystopia. Um, a lot of it is me just sort of like cranking corporate culture up to 12 because I think it's like really funny or like, you know, yeah. having like euphemisms where like being fired means that you're uh, mandatory donating organs and things like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, but, um, but the other one is there's this um, really, really, really funny meme sect of 
communism that existed for like five years in like I think the 60s called Posadism. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was a whole bunch of people who just kind of looked around and they're like, look, we're never going to get to communism on our own. It just isn't happening, man. But communism has to happen because at that point for some of these people, like, you know, it's borderline a religion. Yeah. Um, and so their theory was that there were aliens and because communism is so much better than everything else, the aliens mm -hmm. had to be communist. And yeah. so what was going to happen is we were about to get into a nuclear war and the aliens would have been here the entire time. And they're just going to jump out from Bush and they'd be like, holy crap, we need to stop World War Three. And that's how we were going to get global communism because it was never going to happen with humans. Humans were never going to manage it because we sucked too much. Yeah. And so like that yeah. was sort of like the element that I was bringing in is um, the aliens show up. And I, I was also remembering there's yeah. a Star Trek Next Generation um, episode where they're trying to like check to see if a world can join the Federation. And at the end of it, yeah. the card's like, these guys blow. No, this is yeah. a bad idea. And so that, like, that's, that's, that's kind not. of... Yeah. yeah, so that's kind of what I was going with is that the aliens show up, just kind of look around and they're like, oh, God, no. And like I, that, that sort of moment, because, it, you know, it's kind of like the opposite of an alien invasion. The aliens are like, you guys are too broken to invade. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like that's you. Of, like, I don't know. Touching that. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like a. So that's kind of what I was going for. And then another thing that I had been thinking about writing forever is um, I read a lot of like sort of um, literature from uh, like, you know, your Kiplings and your like, you know, your colonial authors mm. and all of that sort of stuff. Like, mm. you know, when I was in college and there are a lot of these sort of like, you know, tropes about the savageness and everything. And yeah. I had always had this idea in the back of my head to write a novel where earth was colonized and we're just kind of normal people, but all mm. of these tropes about these like bestial savages that like can't be reasoned with or whatever are being yeah. used to like dehumanize us. And so yeah. that's, that, that was kind of worked in there too. So it's just kind of like the aliens show up. They were just written off as unsalvageable. Other than that, they're like, look, we'll let you play a video game with our people. And um, if that, if, if you can learn to play nice with your neighbors over the course of the next like hundred years of interacting with normal people. Great. We'll let you into our big boy club. But until then, um, no one's allowed to go to your planet because you're all psychopaths. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I read the books. I love them. Um, they're, I, I especially love this like whole like duality and you're you're playing with that a lot right that, like one world two worlds like this happens uh, to Kat because of like her social status um, um, and then not only social status like upper and higher but it also like is the whole like uh, samurai not samurai and then you have like in in-game world the other world and uh, that shit gets it does never really gets complicated um, like the only thing I wish was we could see we would see more of the tower, but I think that, I think that happens like more in like four and five, right? Yeah. Um, no, I mean w one thing is that five there's st there's still plenty of stuff happening in the real world, mm -hmm. but five yeah. is when the importance of tower climbing is um, starting to like it's starting to get more into the forefront in four. Yeah. But like sort of the back half of the six book series is that. Um, mm -hmm there are reasons why um cat needs to hit a certain level by a certain time or yeah, bad yeah. things happen sort of stuff i i like i said i really really enjoyed it like i also really enjoyed the end of book three um at first i thought that was oh wow this is like wow this is like sudden and then i was like oh no actually this makes a lot of sense this is nice because like if you're saying it's a six a six book series that makes a lot of sense like yeah i really like it it was really good thank you yeah and like you've you've piqued my interest with like um a dream of wings of flame um so how do you like, go about that it's one of those things where like i think i misjudged the market i think i i like i loved remonster for example which is mm -hmm. now getting an anime and it's pretty good mm -hmm. um but like i love that one i loved um chrysalis which is you know something yeah. people in our genre are more likely to read i loved chrysalis i loved uh what was veil the howls book um i d didn't want to be a hive queen or something like that but yeah, there were yeah. a couple of these monster evolution books that i really 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 liked and I saw a bunch of people like on Reddit, for example, asking for more of them. 
And the mm. one problem I ran into when I wrote the book is that I think the people on Reddit who wanted more of them were all of the people that wanted more of them. Yes. Um, <laughs> so like there really isn't a huge market for it. I think it's one of my best written series. I really love the series. I really love the characters. Mm. I really love the sort of like world building that I'm weaving into it. I really love how I'm doing all of that. Mm. Um, but there are a lot of people who just kind of look at a main character that's a kobold um, and say, I'm not reading about a kobold. And like, mm. I don't know how to say, well, don't worry, he's not a kobold for long. But mm. I don't know. I <laughs> Yeah, like it's it's... I think I talked with Actus about this and he says like monster MC is like super dead. Um, and I, th I think, I think like sometimes you can, you can kind of like mix that into your smoothie a little bit. Right. Um, I have one project going on where I don't even mention it's, it's monster MCs. Um, it, uh, yeah, but like, it's, it's just like regular normal people, but like, it's, I, I would even hesitate to call it like furry ish. It's, it's not, it really isn't. Like, it's just look at normal people, normal people, and they have like powers. Yeah, no, and I mean, so what's going to happen in that is the uh, the next three books in Dream mm -hmm. Wings and Flame are dual MC, and one of the MCs yeah. is human. And the idea mm -hmm. was that like we're sort of establishing the monster half of things before we start weaving everything yeah. together. Um, so what I'm probably going to do is sort of like soft boot it as a new series that's related to the other series, because mm -hmm. I think that readers are more likely to, you know, yeah. vibe with it if there are humans in it as well. But what I would say is that if it isn't a complete turn off to you as a reader and you're vaguely interested in, um, you know, because I, I don't know, I think the magic system is real cool in that one, too. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd say give it a shot. I I yeah. I really think it's probably my best series. As much as I love Tower of Somnus, I think it's a little better than Tower of Somnus. But I I picked a weird marketing niche for it, and that's on me. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, how else would you tell a story about a about a kobold who wants to become a dragon if it's not a kobold? Yeah. Right. Yeah, makes complete sense. It is time. I've done it. I finally launched Genesis of the Sacred Machine my own little book in its definitive edition. So, if you want to, you can check it out right now on Royal Road. There's a link below the video. Other than that, I really hope you're enjoying this podcast and I could use some of your support. Go check out our Patreon or maybe just leave a like, a follow, or whatever it is on the platform that you're on. Anyway, thank you so much. And let's get on with the show. So what's the best advice you've ever gotten as a writer? Um, right. Uh, it, 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 like we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but mm. like some people learn better from reading about writing. Mm. Um, for me, I'm the kind of guy where you give me a new video game and I'll play it for an hour. I'll realize where I screwed up. I'll stop. I'll play it for mm. another hour. Realize where I screwed up. Stop. And then my third playthrough is when I'm serious on it. And that's kind of how I wrote mm. is mm. I wrote two books that were God awful. Mm. And then I wrote a book that was all right. And then I started writing seriously after that. So like by the time mm -hmm. you actually started seeing anything that was getting anywhere near Amazon or Royal road, you were looking at my third book um, yeah. because my, the ones before that were bad. Um, what I did, which wasn't really advice, but what I would give as advice to other people is um my first three four five books um i thematically would sort of emphasize some aspect of writing hmm. so i have a book that i doubt many lit rpg readers would like i think it's a great book it's about 55 60 000 words um it's called as the god king wills hmm. i wanted to be able to write characters and interweaving plots without mm -hmm. using fighting as a crutch cool. so it is literally a black comedy about a bunch of old priests serving a mad god mm -hmm. there is no combat there's nothing else and it's entirely about their political machinations their friendships their relationships mm -hmm. everything they're doing and so but but that was like i was like i need to work on this and then um i had you know some books where i'm like 
I need to work on my dialogue because my dialogue is stilted. I need to work on um, flow of time because flow of time is stilted. I need to work oh, yeah. on tempo mm. because, and so that's what it is. Like mm. I have a bunch of books that I consider functionally to be project books where mm. the entire time I was writing them, I was trying to, trying to improve one aspect of my writing. And like one, mm. one of my series that actually did pretty well is literally my action project book. Like I, I didn't even consider myself finished learning the introduction to writing yet when I published mm. it. But, um, but like that, that's what it is, is keep writing and always be purposeful about writing. You know, any, any yeah. time you're writing something, y- you need to be doing more than putting words on the page. All you need to know is why you're putting words on the page. There's no yeah. wrong answer. You just need to be thinking about what you're doing while you're doing it. Mm. And, um, mm. you know, sometimes like, you know, it, we'll have jokes where like, you know, in, in discords where it's like, you know, this, this person is going to be a good author someday. They just need to write another 200,000 words. And it's, yeah. it's just true. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, like, this is like also the advice like most people like get, right? Just write. Um, but I think, I think Ravenslegger said it like, it's like write with purpose is what you're saying too, right? Um, and this why can be anything. It can be, and here's, here's my advice that I always used to give. And I, have kind of fallen off of all for, for a while set realistic goals right so don't go like i want to be the, like the next primal hunter or i want to be like you've never written a word and you're like i want to be the next primal hunter like it's not going to happen like 19 out of like 10 it's not going to happen unless you're like Lars Machmüller and like just have like a natural gift for words i guess um but like i mean you know what the goal was for my first book Oh, I wanted shoot. to make enough. I wanted to make enough money off Patreon, to mm-hmm. pay for a professional-looking cover for my next book. That's a very cool idea. My first goal for for releasing Torchbearer, like zero point one, it was I want to get five followers. And yep. I, I get that. And then I was like, cool. Let's see if I can get ten, right? Yep. Because like human psychology is like really really interesting, and basically you want to like manage dopamine a little bit, right? So um, stay away from lots of like dopamine reducing stuff like video games, for example. Um, and instead use the dopamine that you have, uh, don't dump it into, into video game, like go and write, um, and then build your, build your reward system, right? Yep. You, you don't, you don't get better at something by constantly feeling like a failure. So feel like a winner by setting goals that you could actually achieve. The other piece of advice I'll give ever anyone is don't get overly emotionally invested in Royal road. Absolutely. I love Royal Road. Royal Road's great. Royal Road also broke my brain for about a year mm-hmm. just because like I was trying to write enough to produce for it um, while working a day job. Mm-hmm. I was trying to follow up with all of the comments and, mm-hmm. you know, make changes based off of them. And then um, like once I started having books that were doing fairly well, I started obsessing over, you know, oh, my God, I got a two star. Where did that come from? Like at one point, like I, I always joke that um, I was on the best rated jockeying with Dungeon Crawler Carl for the mm. f- fourth through sixth spot for about mm. five months. And I would say, well, you know, obviously we've sold about as well since then, right? Mm. Um, <laughs> but, um, obviously, yes, yes. I'm... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like that was the thing is like, you know, I've got that like. All that I really have from it is like this little fancy platinum number four tag on my Royal Road profile, which is cool. Don't get me wrong, but it's like I, I had like I have I have folders on my old computer where I was like taking mm-hmm. screenshots of like when the numbers would go down for someone like point five bombing me, comparing uh... it to like you know when I was getting bad comments from people on like you know the mm-hmm. comments. It just drove me crazy. Like mm-hmm. so what I, i'm currently not as involved as i should be but where what, what, you, what you should be doing is posting a chapter mm-hmm. maybe reading four or five comments from it responding to them respond to your comments on patreon and interact mm-hmm. with those people because um they care enough about your writing to like actually pay you which mm-hmm. isn't so much because they're paying me but i want to be interacting with the people that genuinely care about my writing rather than the person who's just showing up for like five minutes to be like, you suck dude. And then move on to the next you know, story or whatever. Yeah. 
vent and vent he, their like frustration about like getting out getting dumped or whatever um <clears throat> Like yeah, like the the most important part about that entire thing is like it's usually it's not about you, or not about mm -hmm. me, right? It's people have some sort of like I don't know experience, and then they have another experience, and um, I think I think the the adage of um, people are always wrong, groups of people can be tendentially right uh, is a very good adage. So um, yep, I, I will I will go on record here. My current version of Torchbearer has a rating of. Uh, <clears throat> 3.86 um it's not a good rating um and for a while like if you had told me this like a year ago like or like half a year ago when i released it i would be like oh my god it's terrible but i'm like yeah it's really not that good because i i did some mistakes um this is my my my, my first book right so um i actually went back and rewrote it and i'm gonna see if the next relaunch does better and if not, I'm just going to be like, you know what? This goes on Amazon, whatever. Like, I'm going to do three books and then whatever. But um, yeah, the point about trying to get people to your Patreon. If you have a Patreon, that's a good idea. But yeah. Um, otherwise, if you're really on Royal Road, um, I uh, recommend cultivating your um, comments. So if you have like, if you're, if you're not huge, if you don't have a Patreon yet, you can always go to go to Royal Road and like literally just block everyone who like gives you like a mean comment that you don't want to read. Um, always look at the at the feedback objectively if you can, and then if you don't want to read the read from them ever again, just block them. That's fine. Um, well, I, I I do something like that when someone gives me yeah. like a you know two star review. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain to Kata and Wing and say take yeah. the review down. That's your honest opinion. Yeah. But what I what I'm going to do is I'm gonna say well you clearly don't like my book. So I'm going to save you the temptation and the trouble of that, and I'm going to block you. So don't read my book. Yeah. You yeah. clearly don't want to read my book. That's fine. You know, it's a it's a free country. That's you know, you, you have your taste. I have mine. Uh, but if you don't want to read my book, don't read it. <laughs> like, just yeah. go away. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> it's like they can they can still read it, but they can't comment anymore or rate. Yeah, right? exactly. Which is which is perfectly fine. Yeah, I mean they're, they're um, entitled to their opinion. I but and I've heard it and I disregarded it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So for me, it's like. Um, um there's some there's some reviews where i'm like oh wow ouch 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 but some of them are like really true so again like take, take everything with a grain of salt also disable your ratings like the ratings aren't there for anything but to make you feel bad they're not for you they're for the readers um they might explain why your book isn't gaining any attraction if you're sitting like like one star or whatever um but uh yeah just try and give it try and uh try and give it some time and uh as always, remember, uh, you were saying don't get get too emotionally attached. Um, if you're emotionally attached to your book and you want your baby to do well, uh, understand that not everyone's going to like your baby. It's fine. Yeah, no, I mean, like, I, 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 I'm saying do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> like yeah. I, yeah, yeah. like I, it's very easy to say that, but like the other thing is like when you hit an Amazon launch, oh my god, my, yeah. you know, first book in a series, I can barely sleep. I'm, you know checking for Amazon refreshes, uh, cool. you know, every hour, it just drives you crazy. And I when mean, like, I, mm -hmm. when I, 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 again, I'm just saying this mm -hmm. isn't healthy. Also, I do it every time. Yeah. When I relaunched, relaunched Torchbearer, I made a challenge for myself. I want to try and not look at the ratings or anything for as long as I can. And that was That's fun the, as fun. Good idea. Yeah. I I I did and I did an entire month, and after that, I needed to look at it again because I needed to like do some adjustments. But I was like, "Damn, I really want to break break the streak." I would have happily never looked at the story ever if uh, yep. if I could have. But um, it's yeah, same thing I'm going to do for Amazon launch. It's out there. Nothing I can change. Nothing nothing I could do about it. So good luck. Another um, point for cultivating comments, right? Talk to the people who like your story. Yeah. Tell them that you appreciate the comment and don't be like, thanks, but like really start a conversation. And even yeah. if they're just doing like, thank you for the chapter, I always go through all the, uh, thank you for the chapters and I respond in kind. So if someone yeah. writes like TYFTC, uh, I write like TY, uh, TY. Do the same thing. Thank you for the comment, right? The, yeah. Th th thank you. Thank you for the comment, like really short, short or thank you very much for commenting. Um, or if I'm really funny, like, thank you very much for commenting and or reading, but all in short, uh, like, it's like letter thing. 
Um, and I had like I had like real battles with like one dude who would always go like, "Thanks for writing." I'm like, "Thanks for le- reading." It's like, no, uh, "Thanks for being entertaining." I'm like, "No, thank you for being nice." And like it was like, yeah, every chapter was fun. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and like this is this is what you're doing this for. Like, yeah. if you're not earning money off of it, then it's literally about like finding people who like your stuff and yep. learning how to disregard people who don't like it. Yeah, cool. All right. We've talked about best advice you've ever gotten as a writer. Um, what's one thing that you've learned while writing that you no longer do or would love to go back and change? Um, mostly, I sort of learned a lot of the genre rules for things that I should never have done, but kind of did. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them is like giving my main character a boss that is like sort of mean to them the translating Mm. like i i have a sort of like friendly mean relationship with my friends where we're kind of like Mm. jerks to each other but that's sort of our Mm. friendship Mm. um and that does not translate to the page especially in our genre well Mm. Mm. because if you have a main character and everything is through the eyes of your main character and Mm. your the core conceit of our genre is that your main character may be weak now, but they're going to be powerful someday, you know, or, or they're, they're, or they're not mm. weak now and they're, you know, they start out strong, you know, something like that. It's, it's all about like this becoming powerful, becoming someone important factor. Um, having someone be mean to them from a position of authority triggers that sort of like arrogant young master reflex in your readers Hmm. and when i meant this person to be a supporting character everyone was like no they're the arrogant young master you need to slap their face until you know they they become like a pig or whatever and Hmm. when i didn't do that i annoyed people to no end and then the other thing Hmm. i learned from that series as well is oh my god do not write about the real world uh unless you want to spend forever doing research yeah i was writing again a very fast loose sort of like fun series where wacky things are happening in the real world and i needed a ship full of soldiers to be in florida so i think i said yeah you know military ship landed in tampa and I don't know what percentage of lit RPG readers and authors are ex-military, but it's high. It's like 20% or something like that. Yeah. And I'm just kind of like, yeah, Tampa sounds good. Like I like I don't like I'm gonna be honest, if you give me a map of Florida, I couldn't even put Tampa on that map. Tampa um, has a bay. <laughs> yeah, like that, that that's that's where I'm at. Like I'm from the Midwest, man. I don't know. Um so I just was like, yeah, Tampa, there we go. And I had a lot of people who were very, very upset about how there wasn't actually like a military base there where the ships could land and there wasn't like I, it might have been like you know the, the the bay wasn't deep enough you know there's they, yeah. like they were completely right don't get me wrong they were right i was wrong but also it's one of those things where like if i'm writing about the real world i have to do a whole lot of research into it mm. and like um tower of somnus is as close as i'm going to ever get again yeah. In that it's like a cyberpunk magic fantasy. Um, but even there, I'm sure that the FBI has me in some sort of watch list because um <laughs> like learning how to dispose of bodies in um oil drums filled with um lye, for example. Mm-hmm. Um I I, from that, I actually learned that um, quicklime is an urban myth for dissolving bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, historically, it actually would preserve the bodies from like oh, having yeah. bacteria decompose them, which is why people would talk about quicklime being on bodies. Um, mm-hmm. So if you have murdered a drifter and you're trying to dispose of the corpse, do not use quicklime. That, that, that is something I learned from that. Um, not but, legal advice. Yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> also, don't murder drifters. Um, but, uh, but the, but the other one is like, I had my YouTube algorithm for a while was nothing but these sort of, um, gun testing YouTubes because I was trying, well, because, because there was a scene in book Mm. two 
where someone is standing in front of a car with a bulletproof glass window shooting at it. And I needed to look at roughly what caliber a bulletproof glass window could like conceivably stop before mm. the bullets just go through it. Because like it's a common oh, misconception, for example, that Kevlar Kevlar does not stop rifle bullets. You need to have a ceramic yeah. plate in it. And so yeah. I didn't want to have sort of a Kevlar situation going on where, you know, the bulletproof glass will stop pistol bullets, but not rifle bullets. Yeah. And so I had I, I spent forever on that. And it's just one of those things where like I I like to focus on writing. I don't like to focus on realism research. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. sometimes I have to do it in my cyberpunk fantasy. But if I'm writing about some guy with, you know, a magic sword fighting a Yeti or something like that, um, yeah, I don't have to research that. I'm good. <laughs> it's my it's my favorite comment uh, on uh, on heretical fishing. It's like there's a pet crab. And the main character just like scratches the pet crab and the pet crab is like happy about it. And then one guy was like, the one thing that really took me out was that crabs don't have like, uh, you know, like sensory elements in their shells. Like it couldn't feel getting petted. I'm like, dude, this crab can shoot like aura beams from its claws and like, it, like evolve in like two days. And that's your hang up. <laughs> like this is a like magical cultivation world. And like your hang up is like that crab okay but like the thing is some of the people do have these hang-ups and that's fine yeah right well uh, that's the thing is like i i have those like i, I can't think mm -hmm. of any right now but i absolutely know that i have them where i just have these mm -hmm. weird things where like if you do a very particular thing my brain just kind of like hiccups and it's like mm -hmm. no but you can't do that and it's like mm -hmm. uh, there's magic you, you you're you're a level 11 ranger like yeah. of course you can do that but my yeah. brain just like has like the buffering you know thing going on and i you know i get why it happens to readers but it's also one of those things where like anytime i'm dealing with the real world it's really easy to run into those things where you knock someone out of immersion and so i just don't like messing with it hmm. for me it's like uh, the other thing is like the the arrogant young master thing and that's something that um, i learned while actually while um doing pen and paper role play because i liked i like the idea of having like this kind of like evil boss kind of like like a new kind of character from um <laughs> from despicable me and i sucked at it because i just treated like guys like badly all the time and that's not what it's about right the idea is that you need to act badly and at the same time let people know you still care about them and you can write that character that, that you mentioned but it's very hard because um at the very first page you need to make the reader aware that this is a just banter or B, if they are like this, you need to Im immediately after make them vulnerable to make them relatable. Yep. Right. So I don't know. Have your boss like, like really scream at it, uh, scream at your, at your, at your main character and be like a complete asshole and like describe him, like he has always been an asshole. And then at the end of it, he like kind of like breaks down like the, or the main character does something like brave, like say like, I don't know, like, uh, look like you're really scaring me right now I do have to be afraid for my job and then the boss kind of like breaks down because he never wanted to be like the mean guy and he realizes oh shit he has been the mean guy doesn't mean he has, he has a change immediately but right you kind of make characters believable right make them not no, and, mono and that's part of what happened with that book is i realized that i really wish that i had infinite time so i could go back and rewrite it because um I could write that character correctly, but writing that yeah. character correctly would mean um, probably another five or six chapters focusing yeah. on the relationship between them. And a lot of what pacing is in writing mm. is um, a lot of characters are abbreviated where everyone kind of knows who a character is from a scene and a half because we've seen that character in two other books. We've seen that character in an anime. Like, like you know, there's sort of these tropes where, like, when you have your spell sword main character that has quippy one-liners, hmm. you can kind of fill in the blanks even if it isn't on the page. But if you're doing something new, if you're doing something like, hmm. you know, having a mean character be vulnerable, you kind of need to write out every step and you can't skip any steps. And that means that, you know, if I'm writing a 40, 40 chapter novel, I would need to spend six, eight chapters on developing this person properly. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And that's six to eight chapters that I can't spend on, you know, getting sick loot and stabbing monsters, which is what my readers actually want rather than this character arc. I mean, I got it's 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 it's, um I no pun intended here like mixing kale in your smoothie, right? It's 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 really about the right balance and characterization is fun and you don't always like if 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 you if you're thinking about dungeon crawler Carl, not everything is a fight, right? Like the fights are actually pretty pretty short. Yep. I mean, like the, the the extent of it is long, but. Uh, the fights themselves, the fight scenes themselves are very short, and then they talk again, and then they fight, and then they talk again, and then fight. Yep. Because like you can only make fighting so interesting. Okay, cool. Tell me about one book that you love and why is it awesome? Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you two. These are my uh, two favorite books ever. <laughs> Everyone does that. I tell them, tell me one book, and they give me four or ten or fifteen. Well, I, I, hey, I got it down to two. No, so it's um. Do the Dune movies came out, so it felt like a cop out to just go with Dune. Um, yeah. but I love Dune forever. I have always considered it the science fiction Lord of the Rings because it's just so lore dense. And like the follow up books are good too, but the original Dune is just such a masterpiece. And if you mm-hmm. like the movie, sit down and read the book. Um, it is wackier than the movie, like the mm. like, oh, yeah. Yeah, like there is a lot of weird psychedelic tantric sex stuff going on that I'm not sure it needed to be in there, but it sure as hell is in there. And the rest of it is so good that you're just kind of like, yeah, well, that happened. Let's not talk about the eugenic nuns that control the galaxy. Let's just keep going here, right? Um, Uh, Yeah, also like the, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, then, and yeah. then it's like you get into the sequels where you start getting into like the honored matrix and all that, where you're like, mm. it, it it gets really really funny. And so like one thing that like a couple of my Twitter friends and I will do as a running joke is anytime someone mentions something weird in Dune, we'll just pop in and out of context start talking about the really really messed up stuff from like Chapter House Heretics or you know something like that. Oh, Jesus. Where it's like, yeah, there's a sex cult around a worm. And then you just leave it at that and like just walk out. Yeah, no, it it, it happens. It's weird, man. <laughs> it's, okay, so so Dune, like Tolkien hated Dune. He never said why, but he hated it. And it's it's really interesting to know, like to understand like why, because like Dune is like very, very gray and immoral. And for Tolkien, everything was like, no, it's like black and white. You have good and evil. Yep. Period. Um, but that's the only only one thing. Um, the other thing, like about Dune, most people don't know is like Frank Herbert was like super homophobic, like super homophobic, um, right? So the reason, like, I think I think Duke Harkonnen has like a has like a like many like nubile male sex slaves and shit like that, and he is like quite explicitly a pedophile in the book. <laughs> yeah, quite. Like, he's a pedophile, and like he he has like this like in the movies he just floats, right? He's like floats on this epigraph. In the books, he's described as though he was like like a like like dancing on his tiptoes and shit. So like very flamboyant, very effeminate. Um, and Frank Herbert actually like he had a, had a gay son, and he forbid him from seeing his dying mother. Like, ugh. but you got to think about it. It's still a good book. Well, so it's a good book, and like that reminds me of like the Baron Harkonnen. Um, the Lynch movie isn't really Dune, but you should also watch it anyway. Um, like okay. it's it's barely Dune. Um, uh, David Lynch, I think, famously didn't actually finish reading Dune. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, but what I love about that is like I don't know if you've ever read about the uh, the Disney Evil Queen thing, um, where they um, there were unsurprisingly a whole bunch of um gay creators that were involved with disney in like the golden age and like the yeah, 70s and yeah. the 80s and all that and one of the things they did is a lot of disney villains were like gay coded and they're mm. retrospectively there's a whole bunch of you know back and forth on whether this is good or whether the, whether mm. it was bad um i know a lot of people who kind of empathize with these people and like were mm. like, like for example like scar 
they oh, yeah. mm-hmm. there there was some heavy coding going on there, right? Mm-hmm. But I know a lot of people who are like, it's he's a really cool character because of the way he's coded, and they you know mm-hmm. love him for it. Which brings me back to the Lynch Dune, um, where Baron Harkonnen, rather than an evil mastermind, is basically a Disney evil queen. Yeah. Like he's just like flouncing around and like speaking in couplets for no discernible reason, and like. <laughs> it's- the the like speaking of disney right um so disney i think has a share in fox or fox owns disney uh something like this everyone um, owns everyone yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> speaking of dystopia um but the other thing is i think fox owns the movie rights for the rocky horror picture show so um Dr. Frankenfurter is like a Disney queen, Disney princess, which is yeah. really interesting. Like, I this balances it yeah. all out. Yeah. So, no, yeah, I, like, yeah. It's super interesting. No, like, because, like, the, the entire, like, caveat on this podcast, again, obviously, is like, if you're going out and saying, like, oh, look, like, why does everyone want to, like, shove gay stuff into my face? Like, I get it. Doesn't feel good, right? You don't want to see it. It's fine. The um the other thing though is like it's not f- made for you specifically, right? It's made for other people who just like have their own needs and they haven't had like a movie that has like a gay main protagonist or whatever in a long time, and they want to have have one too. Um, and you're not getting like less because of it. Um, if you really don't like it all that much, like okay, cool, yeah, you have to skip out on like whatever some sort of like franchise or movie or something like that. Um, but then the next one is probably going to be like Petro again or, um, you know, another one yeah. that you can also... Well, I mean, what, like I, what, I try and do, hmm? what I try and do in my writing is um, I try and mimic what I see, which is that yep. um, gay people exist and they're Never not... Seen. Yeah, or so I've heard. <laughs> um, gay people exist and they're not like, you know, stereotypes. They're not... Mm they're not one of these things from like a 90s sitcom where they like walk Mm. into the room and put their hands on their hips and say, I like penis. Like that isn't Mm. what usually happens. Maybe a brunch, but like that isn't what usually happens. Mm. Yeah. Maybe a brunch. Um, So like what I, what I try and do is I, you know, there will be gay people in my books Mm. and they're usually just sort of people like it's going to happen. It's not going to be front and center. Um, I do not feel comfortable as a straight man mm. um doing a coming out book mm. so i will never do that um the books where i have same sex romance um i try, sort of treat it as like uh it was never like the sexuality of the people involved was never a question so there's never any mm. sort of like exploration on why that's happening because again mm. i don't feel like i can fully understand why that's happening so i feel like if i tried to write it it would be crap and i don't want to mm. do that but like there are plenty of gay people out there and Mm. i don't want to make someone's sexuality the focus of my books and it won't be because i'm writing books about magic and swords Mm. and sometimes the person holding the sword is white sometimes they're black sometimes they are straight sometimes they're Mm. gay but ultimately Mm. the focus is on them stabbing a goblin not you know (laughs) the hand that's holding the sword (laughs) yeah exactly the um yeah, like the, the, I think it's a very good take. Like the the other other take, I think that more people should follow in writing is that just because there's a gay character in your story, um, the protagonists or don't have to react in a certain way, either good or bad, right? Um, so, for example, um, if you're writing like if if you're like super pro LGBTQ or whatever. Um, then you need to, and you and you have like a, a gay character in there. It's so easy to go like, oh, everyone loves the gay character for what they are, right? Because that's a fulfillment, wish fulfillment. Uh, because, right? Um, it's hard and more realistic, and it will also cause way less of, of a backlash if you have good people don't like gay people for the wrong reasons or for the right reasons or whatever, right? It's yep. really, really interesting. Um, like that's that's a dynamic that you can have, uh, approach more because like in real life that also happens right like sometimes your parents don't don't uh, like love you to pieces until like you come out as gay right does it make them horrible people maybe maybe not i'm not one to judge um 
right? But like also like f- people who've been assholes their entire time, like the entire time, like don't like someone at all. Um, they will like happily go out and like use a new use a new pronouns without mocking you for it, right? Um, mm-hmm. Like people are multifaceted. People are like especially in relationship with other people, and um, if you just go like oh, they're good or bad, and everyone has to think they're good or bad because they're gay, that is very reductive. Um, and I wouldn't recommend doing it because one way or another, you're going to get people who don't like it. Well, no, like, uh, Blessed Time has a, a bi character in it. Yeah. Um, and he's a flawed character, but it's because he has an alcohol problem, and he's, like, a braggart. And, like, there are problems that are caused because of alcohol consumption. And, mm. like the only like interaction his sexuality has with that is when he actually has a boyfriend, his boyfriend is there kind of saying like, seriously, put the fucking drink down, man. Like, you know, that sort of yep. thing. But beyond that, like, I, I mean, again, I, I feel like it is a statement to not include any gay people whatsoever in a book. Yep. Um, just as much as, putting a character and making the sole focus of what is ostensibly like a magic academy or something like that be on someone's sexuality is also a statement. It's not necessarily a bad Mm. statement. It's just, you're writing a different kind of book than what I'm writing. Um, But like, if again, they're there, just make them normal people. They're normal Mm. people. Make them normal people. If you want to, if you want to, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Right, like it's 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 just it's that's the funny thing. People are like people often go like, "Oh, this is discrimination." No, it's just bad writing. Right? If 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 like, there's this one scene, and I think it's like, um, um, the division, the, the video game. Uh, at the very start, like one of the characters, is like, "Oh yeah, my wife," and it feels very out of place because why why is it being underlined so hard? Right. Well, and that's the um, thing is like I I do get why people get pissed off because there are yeah. things like you know what was it like for Star Wars they're advertising how there's going to be the first lesbian kiss or whatever and it's yeah. literally like they're rapidly panning over a, like a victory yeah. scene and like if you slow it down you can get like two people kissing and you're like yeah. why why are you making this a marketing focus like I yeah. like if you know I get that if there's a bunch of people making out because we just won a battle yeah you're probably going to have some same sex stuff going on. But like, why are you making it front and center? If it's something people are doing, Mm. you know, it's something people are doing, turning it into a marketing thing. Mm. I I think that's a, I get why people feel like that's being pushed in their faces. And B, I feel Mm. like that's not necessarily a good thing for, you know, LGBTQ people, because it's like, Mm. I think they just want to see themselves in books and they want to be able to identify with the books and the movies mm. without having some sort of marketing exec be like, you're a profitable demographic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is like, <sighs> I could talk about, I could talk, talk for ages about the fact that like the people making the decisions are not close enough to the communities that they, uh, that they interact with. But I mean, I said, in well, I mean, it's almost, it's, most of the problems are almost entirely that it's just marketing people that are making the decisions. Yeah. Like they, they don't I mean, there know, are they... there are gay marketing marketing people. Yeah, no, they, I know they, they, they exist. Like yeah. the, the thing is, like everything gets like it's like so overblown or or like um, kind of like rainbow washed um, mm-hmm. because like maybe the, the 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 person who was like, hey, let's have like I don't know um, a telecom um, CSD float that's like right or Christopher Suje float in here in Germany. Um, Maybe that was a good idea, and then the you know like the full force of the entire like marketing department like went behind it and like completely blew it out of out of proportion, and it's no longer about the thing, which is like, hey, let's have a cool fun thing for us. It's about like the company and representation, and this is mostly because of many many rules and regulations and many people who have nothing to do with the subject needing to add their catch up to it. I know, like this is like yeah. It's it's really interesting that like most of the issues that we have like in like socially really boil down to um, corporate structures. Um, yeah, but it's 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 that's a different topic just maybe. Ramming a square pig into a round hole while people are just trying to live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, okay. Cool.
shout outs. Oh, wait, sorry, the second book. Uh, well, th this one's also going to be uh, fairly gay, actually. Um, Cytine. Um, it, uh, it, it's a really interesting one. It's uh, an old Hugo winner by CJ. I'm going to mispronounce her last name, Shira. Mm -hmm. um, she is a phenomenal writer. She won a Hugo for that down below sta station. Um, it is one of the, like, I, I'm trying to think of other books around that time that did have a gay main character. And I really, because it was like an 80s mm -hmm. novel, I really can't think of anything big from that time that like, you know, like there were only a couple of them. Um, but it's also one of those things where like, it's not, it's kind of what I'm talking about where it really isn't the story. He just happens yeah. to be gay. Yeah. Um, but what it is, is it's um, a hard science fiction, like psychological thriller, but not what you would think. Like the psychology is a huge part of it. Um, it's a research institute mm -hmm. where this incredibly important and powerful person was killed and they're trying to figure out what happened. And it turns out while they're doing this investigation into what happened that this person was a psychologist and she was running a project that was this weird form of immortality where they were trying to use clones to recreate yourself. But the way that the, the way that this worked is the clone would recreate a body that was the same as yours, but it wouldn't be the same mind. And so what they were doing is they were going through your entire life and trying to find all of the things that made you you and recreating them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it like I'm not going to get too much into the spoilers with like the main character, but there's like two, you know, two or three characters in this. But a lot of what it is is them taking these functionally these geniuses and saying like what makes you a genius is functionally the trauma you went through that mm -hmm. you know forced you to work as hard you know as hard as you did mm -hmm. to maximize mm -hmm. your talent and it's so it's them using this closed environment in this like closed research institute where they're in control of everything that's happening to try mm -hmm. and force people through the same traumas that the mm -hmm. like person that cloned them went through and it's about these people like only like halfway through the novel fully realizing that they are being like intentionally like traumatized and remolded to be these like historical genius type people oh. and um all set in the same sort of like realm as this murder mystery mm -hmm. um and it is honestly one of the best books i've ever read it is incredibly dense um it's almost entirely literally inside people's heads so um if you're going there expecting sword fights there's like a couple like sort of spy thriller things but it's really 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 just people trying to unlock what's happening to them what happened with this murder um and all of that so it's like a i don't know it's, it's a really well written book if you want to get better about your craft at writing i'd recommend reading it too it is what's more it science fiction uh, what was it? What's it called? Cytine. C Y T E E N. Okay. Nice. And I always cool. recommend that one. It messed me up for weeks. That's, that, that's <laughs> the best, best thing I can say about a book. <laughs> okay. Shout outs. Um, if I were shouting people out, um, I mean, honestly, I pretty much like everyone in the field. Um, the people that I sort of learned to write with, um, I will always shout out. So J.M. Clark, um, Mark of the Fool, um, Valron Prime, um, Ashborn Primordial, um, oh God, what was that first series he wrote? I just remember that the main character's initials were OPMC and that was half the joke. Um, <laughs> um, Magnus, um, Magnus. Uh, Crazy Cody, um, Void, um, Voidborn Devourer, um, mm. Key equals MC squared, um, Crownfall. I, all people that I, you know, learned a lot from, wrote a lot with, all, all just good people. But again, I mean, there aren't a whole lot of bad people in the genre. And this is like one of the cool things about the genre is that all the writers in it are incredibly close with each other and incredibly close mm. to the readers compared to literally any other genre I can think of. 
Cool. Yeah. All right. With that, I think we've like wrong broken the one hour mark. So thanks everyone for coming to the Crit RPG podcast. Um, this has been great. And we're going to keep talking. We're going to keep, keep talking for a while longer. Um, and that stuff is going to be in the extended material over on Patreon that you can subscribe to if you want to. If you don't want to, I would still appreciate it if you would leave a like, maybe a comment, a follow, you know, you know the drill. Because, yeah, it helps me out. It helps me make more of these podcasts and um, alleviate the tedium that is my day job. So, yeah. Who knows? Maybe one day I'll go to the moon. Uh, Kale, any last words? Um, well, it was nice to talk with everyone. Um, read my books, read other people's books, read a lot of books. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening and or watching. And I'll see you next time. And if you're on Patreon, the show goes on.